and welcome to Reddit's Endwalker Melee DPS Preview. This video covers changes to the Samurai, Dragoon, Ninja, and Monk jobs, as well as provide an introduction to one of Final Fantasy XIV's newest jobs, the Reaper. This video is possible thanks to Square Enix, who generously gave us early access to an in-development build of Final Fantasy XIV Endwalker. Due to the early nature of this build, information in this video may be subject to change. Please note that due to changes in battle calculations, potency values may no longer reflect their current counterparts, and direct comparisons will not be discussed in this video. Let's start with a few small updates affecting every job in the role. Similar to the tank role, ranged attacks will now be standardized to a 20 Yalm range, and no longer break melee combos. This means that you'll be able to keep your GCD rolling while disengaged, and then jump straight back into the action without missing a beat. With that out of the way, let's take a look at roll actions for melee DPS and Endwalker. Look familiar? Roll actions have largely stayed the same from Shadowbringers. However, there is one change that is important and isn't yet notated on the Endwalker tooltips. Feint's primary effect will be updated to reduce physical damage dealt instead of reducing an enemy's strength and dexterity. It will also have the secondary effect of reducing magical damage dealt, but to a smaller degree. Alright, enough stalling, let's get into the jobs. To start off, we'll be slicing into the Samurai changes. Samurai is a very straightforward melee job that dishes out high amounts of damage with a variety of hard-to-remember ability names and little to nothing in the way of supported party buffs. With Endwalker, none of this changes. Samurai is still an absolute powerhouse and has benefited from several changes that make it even easier to cut down your foes. As a quick note before getting into the changes, Samurai only lost two abilities in the expansion. These are Merciful Eyes and Hisatsu Seigen. Third Eye's interaction with these abilities was also removed and was changed to simply increase your Kenki gauge by 10. While Samurai's toolkit didn't see extensive changes in the way that some other jobs have, it did receive a fair number of quality of life changes. To start things off, the buffs received from the combo actions Jinpu and Shifu have been given a name separate from the skills themselves. Shifu, which still grants a reduction in skill cast time, cooldown, and delay, now applies a buff called Fuka, while Jinpu's damage increase buff is now called Fugetsu. The reason for this change is due to the fact that these buffs are now applied in several different ways. Whereas before, your AoE combo abilities Mengetsu and Oga would only increase the duration of these buffs, they are now able to apply them at their maximum duration on their own. This leads to a change with how Mekyo Shisui works, in that it allows your Sen-granting combo finishers Gekko and Kasha to also apply these buffs. Speaking of changes to Mekyo Shisui, at level 88, Samurai will also receive the Enhanced Mekyo Shisui trait, which allows you to stack two charges. This should hopefully provide a bit of extra flexibility to a skill that has historically not been super flexible. Tsubame Geishi also receives a similar trait at 84, granting it a second charge and making Samurai's burst damage that much more potent. One thing to note, however, is that the follow-up Iaijutsu attack granted by Tsubame Geishi no longer adds a stack to your meditation gauge. Samurai also received three new skills in Endwalker, or four if you count a follow-up skill. Those skills are Shoha 2, Hiyosetsu, Ogi Namakiri, and Kaishi Namakiri. Shoha 2 is an AoE variation of Shoha, requiring three stacks of meditation to perform while dealing a flat 200 potency to all nearby enemies. Hiyosetsu is a third finisher for your AoE combo, filling the same Sen roll that Yukikaze does by granting Setsu. It is also slightly stronger than Oga and Mengetsu, doing 120 potency worth of damage rather than 110. This allows you to build all three Sen during your AoE combos rather than having to dip back into a single target rotation. The enhanced Ikishoten trait at level 90 will add a new status upon using the ability, in addition to its base effect which already grants 50 Kenki Gauge. This status allows for the usage of Oginamakiri, an Iaijutsu-style line AoE that can be buffed by Hisatsu Kaiten, 
and also grants a stack of meditation. Immediately after use, the ability will change to Kaishi Namakiri, which follows the same pattern as other Tsubamageshi abilities in that it deals more damage but does not grant a stack of meditation. While the new additions aren't groundbreaking, the changes that Samurai received amount to a pretty noticeable bump up in the job's quality of life compared to its pre-Endwalker variant. With a rounded out AoE rotation, fewer superfluous abilities, and greater emphasis placed on burst damage, Samurais will feel less punished during periods of downtime and find it much easier to maintain their mandatory buffs. Diving straight into our next job, let's talk about Dragoon. Dragoon has always been a satisfying job to play as both the damage output and support skills make one feel useful in just about any fight. While the job is fun to play, it does have a lot going on at any given moment, which can sometimes feel a little overwhelming. Endwalker seems to have taken steps to alleviate some of that by incorporating some of their upkeep into the basic rotation. There's only one major skill removal for Dragoon, and that is Blood of the Dragon. While the skill was removed as an active ability, it was re-added as a trait, which will lead to some changes in how the job functions. Abilities that previously relied on the Blood of the Dragon buff have been updated to be freely usable instead. Fang and Claw, Wheeling Thrust, and Mirage Dive can all be used normally without worrying about maintaining a 30 second timer. Blood of the Dragon has been reworked as a trait, which simply increases the potency for both Jump and Spine Shatter Dive. However, don't think you're getting off too easy. Instead, a new timer has been added to take its place called Draconian Fire. This is gained naturally either during your AoE rotation following Kurth and Torment, or during your single target rotation by following Wheeling Thrust with Fang and Claw, or vice versa. Draconian Fire lasts for 30 seconds, and while under its effect, your True Thrust will become Raiden Thrust, and a few new skills will open up to you as well. We'll touch on that in a moment. While Raiden Thrust no longer technically requires you to follow Wheeling Thrust with Fang and Claw or vice versa, you will still want to do so in order to maintain the Draconian Fire timer. Similar to how Samurai's buffs were renamed, Disembowel's damage buff has been renamed to Power Surge. This buff can also be gained by using Sonic Thrust as a combo action after Doom Spike as part of your AoE combo. This means you will no longer have to swap back to your single target rotation during an AoE heavy fight just to maintain your damage buff. A few other small changes to note. Gerskogel now has a 30% damage falloff for all targets hit beyond the first. This change also applies to Nastrond. Battle Litany's duration has been reduced to 15 seconds down from 20, but the cooldown has also been reduced to 120 seconds down from 180. And finally, Lance Charge's damage increase was reduced from 15% down to 10%. However, the cooldown was also changed to 60 seconds down from 90. Let's take a look at some of the new additions to Dragoon. Starting off with a couple of useful traits, Dragoons gain access to Enhanced Life Surge and Enhanced Spine Shatter Dive, which changes both of these skills to now hold two charges. The charge time remains the same as the old cooldown timer. Two of Dragoon's new active abilities are actually just upgrades to Full Thrust and Chaos Thrust, thanks to the trait Lance Mastery 3. These abilities are called Heaven's Thrust and Chaotic Spring, respectively. Heaven's Thrust boasts a 30 potency increase over Full Thrust, and Chaotic Spring has an increase of 20 potency for the direct hit and 5 potency on the damage over time effect. Next up is Enhanced Kurth and Torment, which as we covered before grants Draconian Fire when completing your AoE combo. This also changes Doom Spike to Draconic Fury while under the effects of Draconian Fire, increasing its potency from 110 to 130. Lance Mastery 4 increases the potency of Gerskogel and Nastrond, allowing for the accumulation of First Mind's Focus stacks, which are represented by two scales on the Dragon Gauge. These stacks can be gained by executing either Raiden Thrust or Draconic Fury, which can only be used under the effects of Draconian Fire. The final new ability, and the whole reason for First Mind's Focus to exist, is Wormwind Thrust. This ability is a line AoE with 50% damage falloff after the first target hit, and costs two stacks of First Mind's Focus. Given its short cooldown, 
This should be an ability that sees frequent use, as it doesn't take long to build the required resources to use. This new iteration of Dragoon should still feel comfortable for anyone who spent time with the job before. The changes and additions flow together well, and seems to follow the trend of making slight mistakes in your rotation, as well as periods of downtime, feel a little bit less punishing. Whether you're aiming to become the next Hokage or planning on storming Area 51, Ninja has the right tools to get the job done. It's a strong, agile job that excels in granting a 5% damage up debuff for 15 seconds every minute and, you know, dealing a respectable amount of damage in the process. Starting with some changes to existing abilities, the removal of Shadow Fang changes up the rotation slightly, as you will no longer have to worry about keeping up the dot. Hutan's buff effect now has a maximum duration of 60 seconds, down from 70. This change, however, is offset by a new skill which we'll talk about in a few moments. Assassinate comes up as the biggest change to the current toolkit. It will be available starting at level 40 instead of level 60, and can be used at any time on a 60 second cooldown without requiring the Assassinate Ready buff. The reason for this change becomes apparent at level 56 with a trait called Adept Assassination. This trait upgrades Assassinate into Dream Within a Dream, effectively eliminating one of the skills. Bunshin has been changed to grant parity between its melee and ranged attack potency, coming in at 160 each. Keep in mind that thanks to the upcoming stat and number squish, the way that potency and damage numbers are calculated will be slightly different in Endwalker, and these numbers should not be used as an indication of the skills being nerfed. Ninja learns a new ability at level 60 called Huraijin. This skill will apply Hutan at a 60 second duration, or, if used while already under its effects, will instead extend its duration by 30 seconds. This ability allows you to save a use of ninjutsu at the beginning of a pull without making your party wait on a long timer, or maybe just make recovering from mistakes or face changes a bit easier. Coming in at level 82 is the skill Phantom Kamaitachi. This skill can only be used under the effects of Bunshin, and causes your shadow to deal a large amount of damage to the target, and half as much to all nearby enemies. Melee Mastery is a trait that Ninja receives at level 84, along with Shukiho 3. Melee Mastery increases the potency of Spinning Edge, Gust Slash, and Babakakra, while Shukiho 3 increases the Ninki Gauge gain to 15 when ending combos with Armor Crush or Aeolian Edge. At level 86, Ninja learns another new skill called Hollow Nozuchi, which is only usable when Dotan is active. This skill automatically triggers when using your second AoE, Hakemujin Satsu, and will cause your Dotan to erupt for 100 potency on the first enemy hit, with a 50% falloff for any additional enemies. This is a welcome bit of extra damage if you can convince your tank that Dotan isn't bad to stand in. Bringing up the rear, we have a new trait called Enhanced Meisui at level 88. This trait creates a window which buffs Bava Kakra by an additional 100 potency while the ninja is under the effect of Meisui. And finally, at level 90, we get an interesting combination of new toys. First off, we have a new trait called Enhanced Raiton, which grants the Forked Raiton Ready status for 15 seconds after using the Ninjutsu Raiton. This status allows for the use of Forked Raiju, a new powerful 20 Yom gap closing ability that generates 5 Ninki Gauge. Forked Raiju will then immediately change to Fleeting Raiju for 15 seconds, which is a stronger variation of the first skill that does not generate any Ninki Gauge. These skills are incredibly flashy and offer a very powerful 3 skill burst combo every time you use Raiton. Going into Endwalker, Ninja maintains its speedy and somewhat hectic gameplay style, reinforcing its single target and multi target offerings with a few new abilities. It also reduces some of the tedium involved in upkeep by removing the dot from its toolkit and making it easier to maintain and apply Hutan without needing to use a charge of ninjutsu. Monk has typically been a job that has changed very little over the years. A few new abilities here and there, but nothing that ever interrupted the core rotation too much. Building upon the changes the job received in 5.4, we're finally seeing some real shakeup to the job with a new set of mechanics that hopefully won't make your head spin. 
Monk has had a few of its abilities pruned and or moved around. While some will welcome having fewer buffs to keep an eye on, others may miss the intricate dance of Fist of Wind, Fist of Earth, and Fist of Fire. This also means that the accompanying trait Enhanced Fist of Fire has been removed. Shoulder Tackle has also been removed, as was the Enhanced Tackle trait that granted it a second charge. Fortunately, the movement functionality was reintroduced in the form of Thunderclap, but we'll get into that later. One of the biggest changes that monks have seen in the last few years is the removal of its upkeep mechanic, Greased Lightning. Endwalker is no different in this regard, with the job seeing several changes to how your rotation flows starting as early as level 15. First off, the three core forms have had their duration increased to 30 seconds, including Formless Fist granted by Form Shift. This means that using a Notman to extend their duration is even more of a niche case than before, but it does still extend Twin Snakes, and it makes for a nice emote, I guess. The Raptor Form abilities True Strike and Twin Snakes have had their positional requirements removed, giving the Monk a bit more flexibility with their movement. While the potency values on Monk's basic combo pieces are a bit lower than their melee DPS counterparts, we expect that damage will be compensated by Monk's faster GCD and the new Blitz mechanic which we'll get to shortly. Meditation has been moved to level 15, allowing for the accumulation of Chakra much earlier than before. Similar to the changes made to Black Mage, this introduces some of Monk's high-level gameplay to low-level characters, and makes early dungeons such as Sestasha much more tolerable. These stacks can now be spent on Steel Peak, one of two skills that have been reintroduced from the past. Steel Peak acts as the low-level version of Forbidden Chakra, being a single-target damage ability requiring five stacks of Chakra. The level 54 trait, Steel Peak Mastery, changes Steel Peak into the Forbidden Chakra, increasing its damage substantially. This brings us to our second reintroduced skill at level 40, Howling Fist. In past expansions, this skill acted as a line AoE on a 60 second cooldown, with its new iteration having no cooldown but instead acting as a low level AoE Chakra Spender. At level 74, monks gain the trait Howling Fist Mastery, which changes Howling Fist into Enlightenment, increasing its damage. Riddle of Fire's cooldown has been reduced from 90 seconds to 60, while reducing the damage increase from 25% down to 15. Brotherhood's cooldown has been increased from 90 seconds to 120, with the same effect as before. At level 88, it will be upgraded by the trait Enhanced Brotherhood, granting guaranteed chakra when the monk or a party member lands a weapon skill or casts a spell while under its effects. Perfect Balance remains at level 50, but has had its 90 second cooldown changed to a charge time of 40 seconds, holding a maximum of two charges. Elixir Field and Tornado Kick were changed into skills that can only be executed by our new mechanical highlight, Masterful Blitz, which is acquired at level 60. Masterful Blitz comes online paired with a trait called Enhanced Perfect Balance, which causes the weapon skills used during Perfect Balance to generate a specific beast chakra based on the form requirement of the skill used. Weapon skills requiring or gaining a bonus from Opo Opo form, Raptor form, or Coral form will generate a beast chakra of the same name. These can then be spent by the Masterful Blitz skill, the effect of which will change depending on the beast chakra available. These attacks grant Formless Fist afterwards, and can generate Naughty, another new resource that fuels a couple upcoming abilities. Elixir Field is executed when having three of the same type of Beast Chakra, dealing heavy AoE damage and opening the Lunar Nadi. Flint Strike is executed while having three distinct types of Beast Chakra, dealing the same damage as Elixir Field, while instead opening the Solar Nadi. Oddly enough, while all of the Blitz skills grant Formless Fist for 30 seconds, Flint Strike seems to be the odd one out at 15 seconds, which may just be an error in the tooltip. Celestial Revolution is executed while having any three Beast Chakra available, dealing 25% less damage than both of the previous skills while also being single target. This skill opens the Lunar Nadi or the Solar Nadi if the Lunar Nadi is already open. This appears to be a failsafe if you mess up skill inputs during Perfect Balance, granting you the ability to still open the correct Nadi if your third input doesn't meet either of the other two Beast Chakra requirements. It is a DPS loss though, so be sure to feel the appropriate amount of shame when using it. 
Finally, once you've opened both Solar and Lunar Nadi and have three Beast Chakra available in any configuration, Masterful Blitz will allow you to perform Tornado Kick. This ability is significantly more powerful than before and deals AoE damage, expending both Nadi and effectively starting your Beast Chakra rotation over from scratch. Moving on to a few more new abilities and traits, we have Thunderclap. As mentioned earlier, this is a replacement for Shoulder Tackle, though this ability no longer does damage and is able to target both foes and allies. This ability starts with two charges on a 30 second charge time, but is granted a third charge at level 84 with Enhanced Thunderclap. Riddle of Wind is a new ability gained at level 72 that reduces your auto attack delay by 50% for 15 seconds with a cooldown of 90 seconds. With auto attacks forming a respectable portion of Monk's overall DPS, this should be a nice bonus that requires next to no thought to keep active. Arm of the Destroyer Mastery at level 82 changes Arm of the Destroyer into Shadow of the Destroyer. This new version of the skill boosts the base potency and guarantees a critical hit while in the Oppo Oppo form. At level 86, monks gain a trait called Flint Strike Mastery that upgrades Flint Strike, one of our masterful Blitz abilities, to the more powerful and flashy Rising Phoenix. Lastly, we move on to the capstone ability Tornado Kick Mastery, which upgrades Tornado Kick to Phantom Rush. This ability deals powerful AoE damage with 50% falloff for enemies hit beyond the first. Yes, technically this means that we're back to the days of monks never using Tornado Kick again, but this time it's for a good reason. These new changes to the job should help spice things up for all the monk mains out there. Building upon the update it received in 5.4 and adding a whole new mechanic to play around should have the job feeling new and exciting, and you still get the only job exclusive emote in the game, Anatman. One of the new jobs debuting in Endwalker is Reaper, the logical next step in the already twisted and violent lives led by your local botanist guild. This job represents a morbid departure in tone from the other melees, wielding a Grim Reaper-esque scythe and occasionally drawing upon the power of a void sent avatar. Before we get into the nitty gritty of the actions, let's do a quick overview of the job gauge and the various resources that Reapers will need to balance. At the top of the gauge, you'll see a red bar, this is your Soul Gauge. The Soul Gauge is filled via specific weapon skills as well as your normal single target and AoE combos. Once it reaches 50, it can be spent on powerful off-global cooldowns that generate a different type of stacking resource called Soul Reaver. Stacks of Soul Reaver are not tracked on the Job Gauge and instead appear in your buff tray. These stacks are then spent on powerful positional abilities that in turn will charge up the blue bar on your job gauge, the Shroud Gauge. At 50 Shroud Gauge, the Reaper can offer their flesh as a vessel to their Voids and Avatar, transforming their appearance while enhancing several of their existing abilities. Don't worry, we'll cover all of that in more detail as we go. But now that we have a basic idea of how the job flows, let's take a closer look at the abilities themselves. First up, we have the Bread and Butter abilities. Slice, Waxing Slice, and Infernal Slice make up Reaper's default single target combo. There are no positional requirements on any of these abilities, and they each generate 10 Soul Gauge on use. Reaper also has a two-part basic AoE combo in the form of Spinning Scythe and Nightmare Scythe. Like their single target counterparts, these abilities also generate 10 Soul Gauge on use. Speaking of Soul Gauge, one of the core tenets of the job will revolve around maintaining a debuff called Death's Design, which in turn will help generate more Soul Gauge. This debuff increases the damage dealt by the Reaper to the afflicted target by 10%, while also generating 10 Soul Gauge if the target dies while still under its effect. This debuff is inflicted either through the single target ability Shadow of Death at level 10, or the AoE ability Whirl of Death at level 35. Note that the potencies on these abilities are a fair bit lower than the average potencies of your bread and butter combos, so you'll only want to use these abilities when necessary to maintain 100% uptime on the debuff. Similar to Samurai's Gap Closer and Backstep abilities, Reaper has access to two different movement abilities, Hell's Ingress and Hell's Egress. These abilities unlock at level 20, and each ability will propel you either 15 yalms forwards or backwards, as well as make your next ranged attack Harp instant cast. At level 74, Reapers gain a trait called Hell's Gate, 
which leaves a portal behind at their original location and grants the Threshold status. While under the Threshold status, the opposite movement ability becomes the ability Regress, allowing Reapers to teleport back to their Hell's Gate location. At level 40, Reapers will unlock their personal defensive cooldown, Arcane Crest. This ability places a barrier on the Reaper that will absorb damage equal to 10% of their max HP, but only comes with a 5 second duration, so make sure you're using it when you know the herd is coming. At level 84, the ability will be upgraded to include a party-wide regen effect that only activates if the barrier is completely depleted. Speaking of party-wide effects, let's jump forward a bit and talk about Arcane Circle. This is a level 72 ability that grants the Reaper and their party members a flat 3% damage buff for 20 seconds on a 2 minute cooldown. At level 88 and above, it will also create a small 5 second window during which the Reaper can gain stacks of a buff called Immortal Sacrifice whenever they or a party member land a weapon skill or spell. These stacks are spent all at once on a massive AoE called Plentiful Harvest. The potency begins at a base of 520 and will increase based on the number of stacks spent up to a maximum of 800 potency, which works out to be about 40 potency per extra stack. Lastly, it will also generate 50 Shroud Gauge, the purpose of which we'll discuss a bit later in this video. One last core ability that bears no relation to any other ability in the kit is Solso, unlocked at level 82. This ability in and of itself doesn't really do anything. Rather, using the ability will prime another ability called Harvest Moon. Harvest Moon is a ranged AoE ability that deals 600 potency to the first target hit, with a 50% damage falloff on additional targets. The Solso ability is an instant cast outside of combat, but appears to have a roughly 5 second cast time while in combat, meaning you'll want to use this one either pre-pull or during forced downtime. Now that we've covered some of the core abilities for Reaper, let's take a deeper dive into the stuff that goes bump in the night. Let's circle back to the Soul Gauge we mentioned earlier. In addition to your basic combos, Reapers will be able to build a tremendous amount of Soul Gauge through Soul Slice and Soul Scythe, a pair of level 60 and 65 abilities that generate a whopping 50 Soul Gauge each. Soul Slice is a single target ability, while Soul Scythe is an AoE, and you'll be able to stock two charges starting at level 78. However, Keep in mind that these abilities share their recast timers between them. Now that we've built plenty of Soul Gauge, it's time to cash in with Bloodstock and Grim Scythe, two level 50 and 55 OGCD abilities that summon your avatar to reap and tear. Bloodstock is a single target ability while Grim Scythe deals AoE damage and both of these abilities will cost you 50 Soul Gauge to activate. Starting at level 70, your abilities that spend Soul Gauge will also generate stacks of Soul Reaver. More on that in a moment. Gluttony provides the Reaper with one last way to spend Soul Gauge and generate Soul Reaver stacks. Acquired at level 76, this OGCD ability will cost you 50 Soul Gauge to activate, but in return deal massive AoE damage at range on a 60 second cooldown while also generating two stacks of Soul Reaver. Given its potency and the fact that it generates two stacks instead of one, you'll want to prioritize Gluttony as your first spender of Soul Gauge and then fall back on Bloodstock and Grim Scythe when Gluttony is on cooldown. Okay, so going back to Soul Reaver, what is it and how do you use it? As we mentioned at the beginning of the video, Soul Reaver is a stacking resource that is generated by your abilities that spend Soul Gauge. However, the odd thing about it is that you can't really just sit back and collect stacks. Notice that the abilities which generate stacks of Soul Reaver specify that Stack count will be reduced to 1 when already under the effect of Soul Reaver. What this means is that you'll need to spend your existing stack or stacks before generating more, otherwise they'll just go to waste. As you can see from the footage, using any non-spender GCD after acquiring a stack also seems to immediately dispel the stack, meaning you'll need to follow up any abilities that generate stacks of Soul Reaver with an ability that spends a stack of Soul Reaver. At level 70, Reaper will gain a trifecta of Soul Reaver spending abilities, Gibbet, Gallows, and Guillotine. Gibbet and Gallows represent the only positionals in Reaper's toolkit, with Gibbet being boosted from the flank and Gallows being boosted from the rear. They also buff each other. 
using one will grant the enhanced status for the other, as well as changing the name and appearance of your Bloodstock OGCD. Bloodstock will become either Unveiled Gibbet or Unveiled Gallows, but despite receiving a new name and animation, all appear to be functionally identical. It's not clear if this is intended or will change between the Media Tour and Endwalker release. Similar to Plentiful Harvest, our trifecta of Soul Reaver spending abilities also generates Shroud Gauge, which leads us to the payoff you've probably been waiting for. At level 80, Reapers will learn in Shroud, temporarily surrendering their body to their Void Scent avatar and gaining 5 stacks of Lemire Shroud. Lemire Shroud stacks are essentially the enshrouded version of Soul Reaver stacks. They're spent on the Void, Cross, and Grim Reaping skills, which themselves are just enhanced versions of our Soul Reaver spending trifecta from earlier. The key difference between these skills is that the Reaping versions also grant you a stack of Void Shroud, which are spent on two OGCDs, Lemire's Slice and Lemire's Scythe. These abilities are weaker versions of Bloodstock and Grimswath, but come at the benefit of spending stacks of Void Shroud instead of Soul Gauge. You can see on the job gauge that each stack of Lemire Shroud spent on a Reaping ability is then replaced by a stack of Void Shroud. This means your Enshrouded window will mainly be comprised of alternating Reaping GCDs while weaving in Lemire Slice and Scythe OGCDs until only one stack of Lemire Shroud remains. To cap everything off, we have the level 90 ability Communio. This flashy finisher requires at least one stack of Lemire Shroud to use but boasts a staggering 1,000 potency on the first enemy hit, with 60% falloff on additional targets. However, playtime is over once this ability is used and your Void Sun avatar will have to go back home for dinner. I know this may be a lot to keep track of in your head, so let's go through the basic flow one more time. The Reaper begins by using normal combo abilities and special weapon skills to build the red bar in their UI, the Soul Gauge. Once at 50, they spend it on an OGCD ability that grants them at least one stack of Soul Reaver. Then they immediately spend that stack of Soul Reaver on an ability that builds the blue bar on their UI, the Shroud Gauge. Rinse and repeat the process until the Shroud Gauge is at 50, at which point the Reaper can enshroud themselves and let the Avatar take possession. While enshrouded, the Reaper alternates between enhanced versions of existing weapon skills and OGCDs before ending their transformation with a big finisher. Who knew that the life of a murderous void scent summoning farmer could be so complicated? With its frequent use of OGCD abilities and the way each of the different resources feed into each other, Reaper appears to be a DPS job that will appeal to both the button mashers and the great thinkers alike. Thank you so much for sticking with us through our preview of the melee DPS role in Endwalker. We'd like to hear what you think about these changes. Will you be spooking it up and going scythe to scythe with Xenos as a Reaper? Is the allure of becoming a true moon monk too strong to resist? Join the discussion on Reddit and let us know what you think.